Welcome to the Ghost Story Salon. I'm your host, Jolie Holland. We'll be talking with my friend Casey Neal, a musician and songwriter who I've long admired for his work in environmental and leftist movements. We're talking about this big online benefit we're both on to help create a free hospitality house for family and lawyers of people incarcerated at Louisiana State Penitentiary. It's out in the middle of nowhere and it's very hard to visit. Please get your tickets at Noon Chorus slash Abolition. That's N-O-O-N-C-H-O-R-U-S dot com slash Abolition. Hi, Casey. How are you doing? I'm doing good. Nice to see you, Jolie. Thanks for coming on the Ghost Story Salon podcast. Yeah, nice to be here. But we're not talking weird stuff in the uh, dream world entirely. We're going to be talking weird stuff in the real world. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) I'm helping produce this benefit uh, to start a free hospitality house for family and lawyers of people who are incarcerated at Angola. And thank you so much for joining along and contributing a song. And you wrote a song about someone who was stuck in Angola. Yeah. I wrote it about 20 years ago. Um, It's about a guy named Hayes Williams. And Hayes was a bystander at an incident, wasn't even in the building where the where the shooting occurred. And uh, the owner of a white service station, like an auto service station, was killed. And he had he had a lawyer who was you know disbarred like a few years later for alcoholism and he just told him you know you're going to get the death penalty and you should plea out for second degree murder and so he did and went to angola and then experienced you know, all of the horrific conditions there and filed a lawsuit he started like collecting information about it and and documenting they they were basically suing, saying they were violating the Eighth Amendment banned on cruel and unusual punishment. That lawsuit was filed in 1971. And I think if I have the details right, it was ruled on in 83, finally. And the judge said something like, no right-thinking human could think the conditions at this place sir, were okay. And so they won this lawsuit. Uh, it was him and three other plaintiffs. And the result of it was then that they targeted Hayes and they kept denying his parole. And so the people who were act- like the actual gunman in the incident he was outside of were let go. Hayes wasn't. And he- they didn't let him go till 97. So that I sort of encountered the story around, I think it was 99 or 2000 and-, and wrote a song about it. And so when you asked me to do this event, this was like right there to, to do. And, and it's-, it's a song that's never really left me, but it's been really cool to revisit it. It's remarkable that you did such a good job with the song that you feel good about it 20 years later. For me, as a songwriter, that's impressive. Yeah, I, I feel like it's sort of around the time that I feel like my music got good. <laughs> you know, it's like this, <laughs> this period before that, that, you know, I'm sure you encounter this too, where people like love certain periods of your music and are like, and you're like, oh, I don't know, you know? And so I have, I have some material before that that I don't feel that way about, but. But songs here or there. But yeah, that one, I feel like it sort of did what I think protest songs should do, which is tell a story and make a human connection and not be, not either be sort of vague platitudes that don't really connect or mean anything, or also not be just lefty cheerleading that also doesn't connect because it has the emotional weight of a bumper sticker. Right. Because like if it's too sort of like insular. Yeah. Protest songs are so interesting to me because you have beautiful, like, modern R&B songs. Like, they're just a jam, and there's, like, one verse that says something super important, but otherwise it's just a jam. Those kind of songs are really impressive to me. And then I think about the ones that have, like, very long-term cultural importance, like Bella Chow, you know, where it's almost like, it turns into almost like a like a poem that you don't necessarily even know what it's about, but everyone knows the history behind the song. Yeah, I mean, there's so many great examples, but they're pitfalls too. I wrote a lot of protest songs when I first started playing music because I sort of came to music from activism. You know, I mean, I'd I'd 
been a musician my whole life, but I'd never played in front of people seriously until I started doing it in activist worlds. And then it sort of became this thing I did. But then I stopped doing as much protest music because my standards for what it should be changed. I, I don't know, maybe it's a bourgeois concept, but I feel like it has to be art first for it to be effective. You know, I can feel that. I mean, and that's why those R&B songs are so great. Because they ground themselves in art first. Yeah, and you, and you get people moving to a beat, and then you can kind of put this other thing there. The, the thing that Utah Phillips always said is with, with sort of funny songs, if you, what his line was like, well, if you get people laughing, then their mouths are open and you can put anything down them you want. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. It's a tricky business to get it right. And I mean, at the same time, it's so interesting now to see so many, so much music it's almost to the point, I mean, it used to be where if you had political t- content in your music, that was like a strike against you in the world of the music business. Like you wouldn't, people would be like, oh, that's, you know, sketchy territory. And, you know, now it's like, it's almost like if you don't have political content in your music, it's a strike against you. Like it's even from major pop artists all the way across the board. It's like the number of people singing about what's going on is... It's cool. What era was it uncool to have any political content, would you say? I mean, I think it was more just in the music business itself. Yeah, there was some like deal where a label had been pitched my music and they were like, oh, well, he's, he's a political guy. We don't we don't do that kind of thing. And, you know, and this is sort of when, you know, 99 percent of the people you encounter in the music business have let have sort of left politics, but they got would get very touchy around it. You know, and so in the kind of underground circles of music in the 90s that wasn't the case i lived in olympia for years where in various ways we you know everyone was doing that um, with with a number of different genres of music and a number of different political bents and it was you know i don't know fertile ground for that kind of thought and music and but i don't think it ever it, it was never that mainstream right it was kind of like um ground zero for the riot girl stuff mm. but uh didn't go mainstream. Where did your political consciousness come from? My dad was fighting a development when I was a kid. He was into environmental preservation and then and he got into maritime preservation. And so he ended up working at the South Street Seaport in New York. And I just, you know, had gotten into environmentalism and then was around, uh, you know, around sea shanty singers, around saw that the Clearwater Sloop, Pete Seeger. And so I, was, I sort of heard that kind of folk music, but then, I mean, I think honestly, it was seeing MTV videos, <laughs> which is weird. I mean, because, I mean, I was just saying that like, you know, political music wasn't mainstream, but it sort of was in a weird way in the eighties where there's all that sort of cold war anxiety built into songs, like, you know, whether it's Peter Gabriel's Games Without Frontiers or Lease Invisible Sun or, that Australian band had that big song, How Can We Dance? When our... Night Oil. Yeah, yeah, that was huge. And that was that was exactly that message. You know, and I think also MTV was kind of the first place that like, you know, people, a lot of people kind of slag the 80s and, and maybe it's generational for me, but I just, I kind of love the music. And it's also, if you go and look at it, it's like there's, it's sort of the first time that you started to have like, queer identity show up in mainstream music Mm -hmm. well out out you know because obviously queer people have been at the forefront of so many different genres from gospel and uh, and gospel and r&b and it's interesting seeing how so many queer people were were so important in the church and the church a black american church is so important to music in general in america but it was a place where you you couldn't be out. Right. Uh, there's that whole thing about performers that goes back to, you know, sort of European courts and things where there would be sort of these singers and stuff. It was very androgynous. And, and that I, guess, I think it's always been an element of music. But yeah, it was the first time in the 80s where it was like, you know, it was it was out and here we are. Here's, here's Frankie goes to Hollywood to deal with it. You know, I mean, there's there's actually a there's a meme that goes around and it's you, it's sort of shared by people usually as a way to, to say how modern music has gotten worse. And I think it kind of illustrates the opposite thing. It's like this thing that it's like a moving graph of who is number one in the charts. And so if you, 
in the sixties and stuff, it's kind of, you know, it's, it's the Beatles and the Stones and all these people. And then, and then in the seventies, it's just like the Eagles all the time. And, you know, there are, there are people of color it got in and out of these charts, but then when you hit the eighties, it's like, suddenly it's, it's Prince and Michael Jackson and Madonna. And in, in this way, that's like, you can, and even up until now, you just can watch it change from being basically dominated by people like the Eagles to people who don't look like the Eagles um, over time. And it's, and it's, I, th I think it's actually you know, serves the opposite purpose. It shows like how music's got more represented, more, you know, there's more representation. And, and with that comes all kinds of different sounds. And I think so much about how there's so many people who are not like these white northern european characters that are have always been so important in the music business you have all the the jews that were kind of like cosplaying cowboys all that stuff then there's like the history of of blackface which is you know always with us in music and that was american popular music for for 200 years was blackface and you know it, it's barely changed you know it's like the rolling stones were like almost this epitome of that sorry i don't i'm not trying to make a point i'm just trying to say <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I agree with you rock and roll rock and roll rock and roll, rock and roll. been here forever I said Elvis Presley ain't got no soul. Huh. Chuck Berry is rock and roll. Rock yeah, right. You may dig on the Rolling Stones, but they ain't come up with that style on their own. Uh -uh. Elvis Presley ain't got no soul. Hell no. Little Richard is rock and roll. Yeah, right. You may dig on the Rolling Stones, but they ain't come up with that shit on their own. Uh -huh. Guess that's just the way it goes. You steal my clothes and try to say they yo. Yes, they do. Business is so filled with things at home. Trying to make Right at the beginning of the Trump administration, it was actually before he was elected. It was right after he was elected. I got a call from a friend of mine who's the director of a major environmental group. And he said, hey, we want to do a, a political roadshow and go out on the road and we're going to just start to build resistance. And this was this was maybe. Was that like in 17 or so? Uh, yeah, it was. I think our first show was like January 3rd, 2017. It was right before the inauguration. And you went out with a couple indigenous artists. Is this right? Yeah. Lila June, who is an amazing activist and she's a rapper and beatboxes and. She's the best. Time traveler running faster. Warrior is born. Battle to be won. Past trauma, future hurt. I'm a child of the dirt and I'm ready to give birth. Planting a dream, panting a breathe. Running towards the future with a handful of seeds. It was just kind of a collection of activists. And at first we didn't know what we were doing. They just sort of put us on the road and they organized it in five weeks. And there were two legs of it. We were kind of on a southern route and there was a different crew of people going across the north. And it ended up being 18 states and I think 30 shows from, you know, big, beautiful theaters to small info shops to community centers, all kinds of different places. But one of the things I was talking to a friend of mine at home and she was saying, well, you know, it's so great that you're doing this, you're, that you're involved in this activism stuff. And, and she was like, God, I'm just I'm not I'm not doing anything. You know, I don't I don't do work like that anymore. And 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 this is someone who is a healthcare provider who does who was working in a 24 hour uh, shelter for HIV positive homeless people in Seattle. So deeply important and very difficult work. Yeah. And I just said, you know, you got to be kidding me. Like, I'm, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm sitting in a van most of the day and then mm -hmm. singing a handful of songs. And, you know, maybe it's. Uh, maybe I'm making a difference. Maybe it's some, it's music. There's always this element of like, am I just up there on some like vanity trip or whatever, but we don't uh, know. We, we don't know. know. We don't know how, because it's, because basically you're, we're um, affecting inter internal experiences for our, 
audience and you know maybe it's emboldening them to do things maybe it's informing their analysis we really don't know and yeah seeing kind of like what someone who's doing work like that is like no that's that is activism too and the pandemic has really shown that to our whole society in a way that it was not appreciated before and then just thinking just thinking about that level of of just being called upon to sacrifice things and i think about it in terms of the song i have about angola too because hayes williams he filed this lawsuit he won it that changed people's lives inside and he suffered he suffered for it and you are making sure people know his story 1967 three men and a few drinks heated words at the fill-in station and it happened before you blinked oscar meeks the station owner lay shot down in a pool of red and the cops of louisiana sought the men behind the lead sort of talked about what makes a good political song or what's the job and I think the job is to amplify unheard stories it's welcome to Angola a living nightmare said you had a recurring dream yeah when i was a kid i had this recurring dream where it was night and there was kind of neon lights and i was walking down the street you know i was myself in the dream as a kid i was with adults i don't and um we went into a bar and and it may be a chinese restaurant and bar because there were these stone lions outside the door and i remember walking in and and one of the lions turns and looks at me and it it wasn't it wasn't terrifying but it was just sort of fascinating and creepy and then we go into the into the bar and it's kind of a long narrow room with a bar on the left side and tables and and i remember the smell like I, there's there's that thing where there's this smell in the dream and fast forward like 20 years to the late 90s and i in Portland, Oregon, and there's this bar here in town, the White Eagle. And the White Eagle's a, a fascinating place. It goes, I think it was started in the early 1900s. Um, it was a uh, meeting house for Polish anarchists. Wow. And then in the 60s and 70s, it became like the house venue for the Holy Modal Rounders. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. And it's really cool if you go in there, there are posters on the walls from all these shows that happened there that, that the Rounders played and Michael Hurley and that whole crew. But it's notoriously haunted. It's a hotel upstairs. And so I, I hadn't been, it was my first time in the White Eagle and I walked in and I just froze in my tracks because it was, there were no stone lions outside, but it was the bar from my dream, including including the smell, including just the complete layout of the room, everything. And I just was like, it was this overwhelming feeling. And, and I still, I still kind of get the shivers when I walk in there now, but I also love it. And I've, I've played music there a lot over the years and upstairs there's this hotel and, and it's notoriously haunted. They actually, they're the names of the ghosts that they have and the, the history of, of what happened when they died in the hotel. And I think there's supposed to be two or three. Have you ever attached any meaning to that experience? Or, or was it just like, that was weird? I'm a pretty agnostic person in life. And I'm, um, I wouldn't say, I mean, I think, I think the world is full of wonder and, and beauty as much as anything else. And all of that magic in the world to me is just natural systems and outer space, you know, and <laughs> to, to me, the beauty of all that is that we don't know shit about it really. And what we know is incredible and there's so much we don't know. Um, so this gets me more thinking about time, just deja vu, those things where you're like, 
is, am, am I where I'm supposed to be? Maybe there's something we don't understand going on there. But yeah, not to attach too much too much meaning to it, but I just, I, I think it's cool. This great musician that I, I get to play with every once in a while, this guy, Keith Carey, I would tell him like synchronicities that, that were happening in my life. And he would say like, wow, that hasn't happened to me for 30 years. <laughs> you know, <laughs> he's an older guy and, and oh, older than us at yeah. the time and um, the rest of the band. And I just um, I like what you're saying about like guideposts, you know, when you when you hit a patch of synchronicities, it, it's so um, yeah, it's just uh, it just feels magical. And and Keith Keith's life was really, really magical. Like, just like he lives in this beautiful house and this beautiful place and makes all these amazing instruments. Um, and he has this very sweet family. And so it just kind of seemed like, oh, you followed the goal, you followed the guideposts and you got there. And now you, you have no more use of that or something like that. And then my main guitar player is this guy, Adam Brisbane, like for the past few years, like I've, he's been kind of like a defining sound of my work. And I was like getting into this ghost story collection project and talking to him about it. And he would always say stuff like, I don't believe in magic. I don't, I don't, I'm not interested in that stuff. And it's like, you don't have to believe in it because you are it. Like whatever, his playing is so amazing. Yeah, there's a guy I worked with for many years, a producer and violinist, this guy, Johnny Cunningham, who's from Scotland. He was one of the kind of premier Celtic fiddle players, Scottish fiddle players. You and him play so beautifully together. So gorgeous. Oh, thanks. Yeah. And we, we were working on a record in New York in the early 2000s and and he passed away. He had a like a heart attack at 47, I think. Ah. And it was it was genetic um, in his family, and he hadn't been to the doctor in years and stuff. But Johnny was really he was one of those people who had one foot in one world and one foot in the other world, and it was in his it was built into his playing. It was built into how he saw things. But he also was you know Scottish and hilarious and and could be very cynical about things. And he would always say to me, he'd be like, "Coincidence." I think so. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's really good. That's wonderful. And I think he, I think he sort of knew that he was. Uh, and I, I, I had a couple conversations with him, before, like maybe a week before he died, where he sort of sat me down and had this very serious conversation with me about what I needed to do, believing in my music more and all these things and we were supposed to do a tour together that spring and he kept being really vague about it i was assuming he was used to a different standard of touring than i was used to and i, and I was willing to you know help him you need your own hotel room every night we can make that happen you know we'll just work it out and he just keep kept being like oh you know he kept being really vague about it almost like he didn't think it was going to happen and i kept being like does he not think this is going to happen um this is i guess this is more in the synchronicities of that weird kind of in, intuition thing but uh, the winter of 2020, I had, you know, I had a bunch of shows scheduled for the year. My band was going down to South by Southwest and I, I played there a bunch over the years of the first time we were like in the actual festival. And then I had a couple of things on the East Coast I was doing, but it was, I'd sort of organized it poorly, which, you know, I, I always joke that like my level of organization or, or business acumen in music is like 95% better than most musicians but that's still really terrible <laughs> well i mean a lot of bookers are are not that much better at it either right and especially right. considering like the starvation wages of it all i had one of the best bookers in the business that on he put me on this one tour where i got 11 hours of sleep in a week oh man and i i started to develop like a uh an alarming retinal problem during that week that I still have, you know, like we sometimes a musician stop thinking about music as work because we're so kind of, uh, and I like to use language from 
from the anti-cult world. It's like we're indoctrinated into thinking that we need to do this or that when it's, you know, if we had been, if you put on your like, uh, you know, working class consciousness hat, it's just murder. Like it's not, yeah. it's not possible. And I'm sort of fascinated by all the ways that we all have like cobbled together doing it over the years. Like, okay, you know, and you're stringing together shows and just kind of, and it's, but this time I was, I was noticing that I, you know, I had a show in Boston and a show in New York and I was going out East and, and I, I was, you know, I was working with a couple of musicians out there. I wasn't like bringing a band or anything, which would have been impossible, but it's just, you know, if you're going to travel that far, I would generally, you know, have at least, five or six shows if not 10 or 15 and it was just two and I was and I kept kind of dropping the ball in a way I like I I felt like there was something in the back of my head that was like these these aren't happening right so your friend the beautiful fiddler he died before those dates could happen he died before those dates could happen uh in 2003 and then this time when I was organizing that spring tour in 2020 there was COVID ahead. We had no idea, but I still was like, I just was doing a, an uncharacteristically worse job than I normally do. Yeah. And it, and, and you're, you're kind of like after analysis is that like, that was you sort of communicating with your instincts in a way. Yeah. That maybe that somehow I had some sense that, Oh, these gigs aren't happening. Yeah. I have a friend who's like a little bit of a, um, savant or whatever. And, uh, one of my best friends and um it was right around hurricane sandy and you know i'm from the gulf coast so like kind of made me feel i was living in new york at the time <clears throat> and it kind of made me feel like almost like the opposite of homesick it was kind of like oh the the hurricanes came to me <laughs> you know cuz like cuz i i grew up with hurricanes like every every season we lived right on the bayou in Houston and like the bayou would like almost flood our house like every year. So, and I go back now and I can see like my, my, the house I grew up in was like a few inches taller than the houses all around it because the houses all around it are gone. But I had this feeling right before hurricane Sandy where I was doing all this preparation and like I bought a whole bunch of food and I was going to cook a whole lot of stuff just in case like, um, the power went out so that I would have food instead of ingredients, you know, and I was the whole idea would just bored me like the the idea of like do you know just cooking all this stuff i was i could not i couldn't get it up for it, and I was talking to my friend on the phone, I was like, yeah, this hurricane's come in, and blah blah blah, and he said, Well, maybe your feeling of ambivalence towards cooking is actually a sign that you're not gonna have to." And the power didn't go out. So I always find that kind of evidence to be interesting. Like a really good friend of mine tells a story about one of his friends um, was killed by, he was actually uh, killed by lightning in Manhattan on top of a building. And right before that, like the weeks before that, this guy was like kind of, a you know, just a regular he had a regular amount of responsibility, you know, like he, he was just, he was not a flake. And the we the whole like couple weeks leading up to that, he just kept losing everything. He, he would lose all this stuff, you know, like some, someone entrusted him with a chunk of money. He lost that. He lost his phone. He just kept losing things. And I filed that away. Cause I, we know that there's some cultures where, where it's more normal. It's like, it's not treated as like a so-called paranormal thing where people are like, well, you know, I'm going to die three days from now. So uh, you should take my herd of goats or whatever, you know. (laughs) Well, thank you for your work. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. Please get your tickets to the Abolition 2021 Online Musical Benefit. The nights are April 9th, 16th, 23rd, and 30th. We're streaming each show for 48 hours. Tickets are available at noonchorus.com slash abolition. Thanks so much to my producer on this podcast, Rob Van Branken. 
And I'd like to thank the whole production team for the benefit show. That's Johanna Samuels and Peter Bauer. And so much love and respect to the pastors of Abolition Apostles Church, Sarah Pritchard and David Brazil, who are setting up the hospitality house near Angola. Thanks for joining us on the Ghost Story Salon.